Good morning, and my daughter's picture, George Scott Shipman, is still true. My black life still matters. Thank you for joining us this morning on this second Sunday of January. We are celebrating Class Leaders Day. We are appreciating the dedication of our class leaders and their leadership and the commitment of the members of those classes. Thank you for your support throughout this conference year. Let us pray. Eternal God, our Father, we thank you for another opportunity that you have afforded us life, health, and strength. We pray now, God, that you would be our leader, teacher, and our guide. We pray that the meditations of this heart and the words of this mouth let them be found pleasing and acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are our strength and our collective redeemer. Speak, Lord, your servant heareth. In Jesus' name we pray. God, Shua the Messiah, we ask it all. Amen. Turn with me to Paul's letter, 2 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, verses 8, 9, and 16. We'll read the King James Version, and then I was really touched and motivated by the Message Bible. The King James is very familiar. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. The 16th verse, for which we faint not, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. With all that has taken place in our country these last several days, this scripture kept coming to my mind. When I looked it up in the Message Bible, it really fit. Listen to Paul's words in the Message Bible. 2 Corinthians, 7, 2 Corinthians 4, 8, 9, and 16. Eighth verse, we've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. We're not sure what to do, but we know that God knows what to do. We've been spiritually terrorized, but God hasn't left our side. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. So we're not giving up. How could we, even though on the outside it often looks like things are falling apart on us, on the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfolding grace. Wow. Just for a few minutes, think with me on the subject. Father, thank you for the promise of renewal. Thank you for the promise of renewal. Before we tap into that promise of renewal, let me ask you to just reflect and remember with me. Some events in human history impact us so greatly that we will always remember them and we will always remember where we were when we heard the news. I'll never forget the JFK assassination in 1963, sitting in my fourth grade classroom in Durham, North Carolina. Do you remember where you were? Walk with me as we remember. I was eating dinner with my parents on Federal Street in Durham, North Carolina, when the news bulletin interrupted Perry Mason. Yes, I like Perry Mason. 6.01 p.m. April 4th, 1968, with a picture of the balcony of the Laron Hotel, the Rain Hotel in Memphis, Tennessee, when Dr. King was killed, and it became permanently etched in my memory at age 14. Remember? How about you? Do you remember? Where were you when the Space Shuttle Challenger tragically exploded in 1986? Or where were you when the World Trade Center imploded 
2001. These images are forever embedded in our memories. For both you and me, and especially our children, we will always remember the pandemic year of 2020. But here we are just 10 days into 2021, just four days after the most egregious national tragedy in recent history, we will remember Wednesday, January 6th. It just happened to be the Christian holy day, the holiday of Epiphany, when a mob of thugs stormed the Capitol. And I wish Gil Scott Heron was still alive because I'd like to tell him the so-called revolution was televised. Different revolution, amen. Walk with me and just remember and reflect. When you think of January 6th, remember this statement. Hear me now. The virus of lies and privilege has tragic consequences. I'm going to say that again. The virus of lies and privilege have tragic consequences. Let's take the first one very quickly. Let's just explore the virus of lies with seven succinct points. Number one, the claim that Trump won the election is a big white lie. And I'm using these words intentionally. That big white lie changed the reality for some people. To believe it, people must disbelieve their senses, distrust their fellow citizens, and live in a world of fantasy, if not delusion. Rigged, rigged voting machines, phantom voters, and hashtag stop the steal. Number two. Big white lies, a big white lie, demands conspiracy thinking, since all who doubt it seem to be now traitors, dividing citizens into believers and unbelievers, us versus them. Number three, a big white lie destroys democracy, since people who are convinced that nothing is true except the utterances that come from the mouth of their leader, not POTUS, President of the United States, but PINO, that's right, PINO, President in name only. Number four, a big white lie will promote violence as it has. Number five, a big white lie can never be told just by one person. Trump may be the originator of the big lie, but it could have never flourished without the allies on Capitol Hill, on Fox News, on AM Radio, or on numerous websites. Number six, political features now depend on the big white line. Seniors such as Senators Hawley and Cruz were planning, I don't know if they still are, were planning to run for president based on the big white line. Number seven, there is a cure for the big white line. Our elected representatives should tell the truth without dissimulation, without denial, and without stuttering. Tell the truth about the results of the 2020 election. Politicians who do not tell the simple truth perpetuate the big white lie, fueling an alternative reality, supporting conspiracy theories, weakening democracy, and fomenting violence that could be far worse than what we saw on January 6, 2021. Secondly, the virus of privilege. Mm. It showed itself fully. The reality, the existence that there are two Americas with the obvious double standard that was seen on Wednesday. A double standard that was seen through the lens of the actions of the Capitol Police. On June 2nd, 2020, members of the National Guard 
armed and wearing camouflaged uniforms, some in riot gear, stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, knew they were coming. Black Lives Matter crowds came, but they were seen, he were seen as a threat and dangerous. But they protested peacefully all day. On January 6, 2021, Donald Trump supporters who were seen, he word, through the eyes of white privilege as what? Non-threatening, were welcomed. They even opened the barriers, were welcomed, and they stormed the U.S. Capitol, breaking windows, wrecking havoc, destroying property, took time to build gallows with a noose on the grounds, and then paused to take pictures of themselves. Yes, even selfies with the Capitol Police themselves and left the scene untouched. One particular gentleman who put his feet up on Pelosi's desk, grabbed some mail, and then went outside, took a picture of it, and held it up, untouched. But the consequences were five deaths, including one of the police officers and a failed coup d'etat. Front page, Chaos on Capitol Hill. And just like Black Lives Matter in June, they knew we were coming. Guess what? They also knew that this mob was coming. This virus of privilege is the same spirit that destroyed Black Wall Street in the Greenwood community when they burned the city of Tulsa, Oklahoma, where 300 African Americans were, ki were killed and over 9,000 were left homeless. The same virus, the same spirit, launched the Wilmington Massacre of 1898, considered the only successful violent overthrow of an existing government on American shores, when an armed white mob left countless of African Americans dead and exiled from their own city. A commercial I saw today, I think it was sponsored and paid for by LeBron James, says it quite well. We took a knee. We were called treasonous. We peacefully protested. We were called dangerous. We organized, we voted, we made history. We were called criminals. And in the end, it was an uncontrollable quaint mob that stormed the Capitol in an act of insurrection, seeking a coup d'etat. It was never about what we did. It's always been about who we are. Powerful commercial. We live in a season where this democracy is still under serious threat. When Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians in 56 AD, his apostolic authority and his ministry was under serious threat. And so were many of the believers that lived in Corinth. No matter how difficult their suffering was for doing this work, the work of ministry, Paul refuses to quit. And he offers some powerful words to encourage them then and us today to never quit. In verses 8 and 9, and also in verse 16 of 2 Corinthians 4, Paul makes these five statements that describe how Christians need to respond to these serious threats and trials in their lives. The five statements describe the true conditions of all believers in this world right now. Listen to Paul's words. We've been surrounded and battered by troubles, but we're not demoralized. King James says, we are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. Just say this with me. These pressures, talking about all that we're seeing in this world now, these pressures will not defeat us. The Greek word pressed and battered was sometimes used for walking through a crowd where people surrounded you and literally pressed against you. Or it was used to describe the pressure that was put upon grapes 
in a lion press. The pressures of life may squeeze us, but we are not utterly crushed. One version says, we catch it from every direction, but we don't let them squeeze the life out of us. Another version says, we're hard pressed on every side, but we are never hemmed in. Thank God, God will always provide an escape. Say this with me. This season of confusion will not discourage us. You gotta say it like you believe it. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Let's be honest. Sometimes, when the pressures are great, we just don't know what to do or which way to go. Life has a way of throwing curveballs at us all the time, and they have already started in just these first two weeks of this new year. Paul himself said in Romans 8.26 that sometimes we don't even know how to pray. And we have to ask the Holy Spirit to pray through us and for us. When we are confused, Jesus is never confused. Sometimes we are bewildered and sometimes we are unsure. That is okay. That is being human. We are not driven to despair, however, because life does not depend on our knowledge of the big picture. We are, and when we are, at our wit's end. That's just when God is getting ready to get started. Even in the midst of all this taking place, I can't wait to see how God is going to handle and cause these things that are happening to work for our good. Often, God does his best work when we are just about giving out and when we are just about giving up. That's when he steps in and whoop, there he is. And so glad that he showed up on Wednesday night all the way into Thursday morning and they did not stop democracy from taking place. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris have been certified. Amen. Say this with me, number three, I'm moving quickly. This opposition will not deter us. King James says, we are persecuted but not abandoned. Listen to the message Bible. When I saw this, it just jumped out to me as exactly what this whole country and we as believers just lived through this week. The message Bible says we have been spiritually terrorized. But God hasn't left our side. So true. The Greek word translated persecuted means to pursue, to chase as a hunter chases his game. Reminds me of all the horror movies that I used to watch where the hero is being stalked by the enemy but he can't see the enemy. You know, you hear the, hear the music dun, 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 dun. and you know that don't go that way. You're trying to tell them don't go that way. But at the same time that they're being stalked. We as believers under threat in this country right now we have to always remind ourselves Scripture says, goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. And they say, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. Say this with me, number four. I'm about to finish. These hard knocks will not destroy us. King James says, we're struck down, but not destroyed. A writer by the name of J.B. Phillips offered this memorable paraphrase. I've used it before, but it is so relevant now. He says, we may be knocked down, but we're never knocked out. It's one thing when I get knocked down that just puts me on my knees and I'm able to pray and God will help me to be lifted back up. The Message Bible says it like this. We've been thrown down, but we haven't broken. Democracy has been threatened, but it did not Break. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your keeping power. 
family. This is the whole point that I wanted to get through to be an encouragement to you and myself. The fifth statement that Paul makes in this fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians, he tells us why we can go through all of the first four statements. He says that we have been promised spiritual renewal. Now listen to this. David said in the Psalms, he said that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. Our bodies are able to repair themselves. Ourselves are able to repair themselves. A cut will become a scab and it will renew itself. That's on the outside. But Paul is talking about something that's going on on the inside. Paul says, verse 16, and I'm almost through. He says, for which cause we think not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man, the inward man, our spirit man is renewed day by day. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for knowing we would have these seasons just like this. But you put the treasure of the good news of the gospel of Christ on the inside of these earthen vessels, these clay jars. You put that treasure of the Holy Spirit in us so that when it was time to shine, when seasons were like this, you would get the glory out of our witness and out of our standing strong and knowing that God is still on our side and yes, he's still in control. The Message Bible tells us again. So we are not giving up. Verse 16. Look it up. We're not giving up. Look at your neighbor right beside and say, I'm not giving up. We're not giving up. How could we? Paul says, even though on the outside, it often looks like things are falling apart on us, but on the inside, where God is making new life, not a day goes by without his unfailing grace. Brothers and sisters, Paul said it again in Romans 12 too. He says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. In spite of all that's taking place, every day that you get up, renew your mind with the word of the Most High God. He will strengthen you, not on the outside, but he will strengthen you on the inside that you may be able to be victorious. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Most High God, for the promise of renewal, for the promise that our spirits will be revived even when we get Punched. Even when we are shocked by what we see, our spirits, our inner man will be renewed so that we will maintain being on the battlefield for our Lord and we will be witnesses in times like these. My brothers and sisters, we have work to do. We've been called for just this kind of season. And yes, I still believe, and I'm going to smile when I say it, in spite of it all, the best is still yet to come. To God be the glory. May heaven smile upon you. May our class leaders and all of the members of our classes continue to shine and stand strong. Father, thank you for the promise of renewal. To God be the glory. God bless.